Hello, everyone, and welcome to this latest edition of the Pinstripe Prospects Podcast, brought to you by Velocity 5 Sports Restaurant and Bar in Sterling, Virginia. I am your host, Rob Terranova, and I have to say it is good to be back. We've got another jam-packed episode for you this week. This is episode number 39 of the podcast, and we'll be talking about Baseball America's newly released Top 100 Prospects list, the pitch clock debate that has grabbed headlines this week, as always, some hot stove rumors, and a familiar name cracked Emily Popline's top lefty pitching prospects list. Before we get to all that, let me introduce our panel for this week. Some guys that you will definitely recognize if you've been following us. Joining us from Scranton, Pennsylvania, a chilly Scranton, Pennsylvania, our Scranton Wilkes-Barre Rail Riders beat reporter, Tommy Romanelli. Tommy, how you doing tonight? Well, for chilly, it's been 50 degrees here today, so I felt like wearing shorts and, you know, going suntanning, but uh, otherwise, I'm great. That's great, Tom. I just have to give you kudos. You did a great job filling in as host last week, uh, so thank you for that. Not a problem. It was a lot of fun, and I picked a really bad week to be sick while doing it, but I uh, feel much better now. Awesome. Happy and to have you back, too. Thank you, and we look forward to you continuing to feel better. And from Charleston, South Carolina, where it's not as cold, our Charleston River Dogs beat writer, Joseph Dixon. Joe, how's, how's the uh, clammy weather over there in South Carolina? Well, it's been cool, but uh, today uh, it got up to around 78, so it's, it's a little warm for this time of year even for us, but we'll, we'll take it, and uh, we have a cool down coming, so we'll be in the 50s for the next probably couple of weeks. And if you heard that sound, it was all of our viewers in the Northeast who just reacted to you saying it's 78 degrees over there. But guys, we have so much to get to, so let's just dive right in. As I mentioned at the top, Baseball America recently released its top 100 prospects list, and six Yankees prospects cracked that list. Gleyber, Gleyber Torres, Chance Adams, Miguel Andujar, Albert Abreu, Estevan Florial, and Sheffield, J- Justice Sheffield, excuse me, all made that list. No surprises there, in my opinion, names that we've been hearing a lot about. But, Tommy, let's start with you. You had a chance to look over this list. Any surprises? First reaction. Yeah, I, first reaction. I was a little bit surprised that Chance Adams was on there. Uh, he, had, I mean, he's had a phenomenal uh, couple of years in the Yankees organization, but uh, I just didn't think that he was as highly touted prospect as some of the other guys in the Yankees farm system. Although uh, definitely rising up the ranks. Um, so I guess it's only a mild surprise with him. Um, I think I'm a little bit more surprised with some of the names that aren't on the list, which, you know, includes a guy like Domingo Acevedo. Um, you know, I really thought that he'd be on that list, but, uh, but for as deep as the Yankees farm system is having sex on there is phenomenal. So you can't really ask for much more. Joe, how about you? What was your first reaction to this? Well, I think uh, I wasn't surprised by any of the players that are on there. Of course, we talk about these guys every week, and we've seen you know these guys come up through the system. So, I didn't think anyone anyone was a huge surprise as being on the list. Um, Tommy does bring up a great point with Domingo Acevedo. Uh, he's a guy who I think uh, could be a, a very valuable part of the rotation if he continues to develop. Um, another name that I'm just going to throw out there. Um, Maybe he's about a year away, but I really like Frazier Perez. He, he compares um, to Albert, Albert Abreu in a lot of ways. And in fact, some scouts uh, in Charleston, um, overhearing them talk, uh, some of them even like Frazier Perez over Albert Abreu. But again, he's younger. Um, he's coming up kind of behind these guys. So um, I, overall, no big surprises. But yeah, Acevedo would have been a, a nice addition to the list. You guys kind of touched on my next question that I was going to ask you, which was, who do you think got snubbed from this list? And any names surprise you? Tommy, I know we had a chance to talk before we started, uh, before we went live, excuse me. And you did mention a bit of a surprise to see Chance Adams. Yeah, and I got to see Chance pitch a lot this year in Scranton. And don't get me wrong, his stuff is phenomenal. It's a well-deserved spot on the, on the list. It's just from where he was when he first came into the Yankees organization, especially starting off as a reliever, it actually really speaks volumes to how far he's come in such a short amount of time. Um, I think that in terms of pure talent, uh, a guy like Acevedo and you know Albert Abreu, definitely their ceiling is much higher. But, but Chance, I mean, he locates well. 
he has good command of both sides of the plate and uh, you know he just needs a little bit more refinement on those secondary pitches but uh it, like i said it's well deserved he he really is rising up the ranks and his numbers have been phenomenal coming in um he's been hyped up a lot the last year so it you know, there's really no wrong answer for the for the list. I mean, again, you could only pick 100 prospects out of all of baseball. So, I mean, I think that's most impressive to me. And um, it's actually nice to see that he's gotten some recognition from the professional scouts to be on that list from a, a site as reputable as Baseball America. So I think that it's uh, it was definitely surprising, but at the same time, well-deserved. Joe, sure, how about you? Anyone else you think got snubbed? I wouldn't say snubbed. I mean, I think all the guys kind of earned their place on the, on the list. Uh, I mean, Tommy's right with Chance Adams. He's he's a little higher than I thought he would have been. Um, I mean, Albert Abreu, um, I wouldn't say he was snubbed. Obviously, he made the list. But um, I am a little surprised to see how, how far he's come in a year. He really did um, fly through Charleston last year and went up to Tampa. And he's he's been a been a pitcher to watch, really, over the next year or two here because he's got the, uh, the ceiling to become – one of those starters that we, we may be talking about for the years to come. And I think that's part of the, um, the thing with the Brayo too, and, and guys like Frazier Perez and Acevedo and, and talking about maybe an addition to the, to the rotation up in New York. Um, to me, I would rather see some of these guys get a shot than sign, sign a veteran to a long-term contract uh, either this year or, you know, trade for one in the middle of the season and get locked into, whereas your rotation has nowhere for these guys to kind of settle in. So um, no, no major surprises, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, where guys like Albert Abreu end up next year and, and guys behind him. Joe, you just touched on something pretty important and something that's been in the news fairly recently. Of course, I'm talking about all the rumors about the Garrett Cole trade. Chance Adams was a name mentioned a lot linked in that deal, a player that the, uh, the Pirates obviously wanted, and Cashman didn't budge. He didn't, he didn't give in. He's a player that he coveted, he wanted to hold on to, and he did. So seeing this list and seeing how high Chance Adams is, does it give a little bit more justification to Cashman's decision to hang on to him rather than trade him away to Pittsburgh? Sure, let's start with you this time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think guys like Chance Adams deserves a shot. Uh, Justice Sheffield, who we haven't really touched on a lot so far, he, he deserves to get a shot at some point. And then, of course, Albert Abreu. And, and as we mentioned, guys like, you know, Domingo Acevedo and Frazier Perez who aren't on the list, who we know are very good pitchers. So there's a, there's a lot of a good talent coming up, and there's, there's no point in – in over trading at this point, if, if I may say, I mean, there are prospects, you know, there, there are so many prospects in the system that you can put together deals, whereas you can lose a few of these guys, but the top tier guys, I, I'd rather see those guys get a shot in New York. And also, you know, they keep talking about the luxury tax and keeping underneath the, the threshold there. These are the, the type of guys you want to keep so that you, you can meet those goals. How about for you, Tommy? Does Seeing where Chance Adams falls on this list, does that almost, you know, maybe comfort the Yankees a little bit more having held on to him rather than giving him to Pittsburgh for Garrett Cole? Well, I don't know if it comforts the Yankees, but it certainly does help justify it because I know there was a lot of debate about how valuable Chance actually was when it came to those debates. Um, so, I mean, the one thing that stands out to me here is that when you when you're trading for a guy like Garrett Cole, uh, or I should say a guy um, that you're going to have to give up a lot of great prospects for, you're going to want that guy to be you know a can't miss guy. You know, Garrett Cole for the talent that he has, there were some numbers that were uh, a little scary. So you could have traded those prospects away, and if you got the Garrett Cole of last year, that gave up a ton of home runs in PNC Park. Uh, it's you know, it, it, that is a little concerning, and I could understand why they wouldn't want to give up some great prospects. And now you see that the rest of the MLB, you know, really does think of Chance that highly as well. Um, another point I want to make, too, is when I look at this uh, top 100 prospects, um, I think the guys that are usually really stand out on this list are a guy like Esteban Florial, who's and maybe Alberto Bray, who's further down in the organization. I look at a lot of these prospects as prospects who can make an impact either this year 
or next year, some guys who are close to the majors because they're the more developed. So right now they would be the better prospects. So one, I think it speaks volumes about where Florial and Abreu are in, in their development and their talent level compared to the rest of the minors. But I also think that that could be a reason why you see a guy like Adams on there because he's developed into such a solid minor league prospect that, you know, right now, if you were to throw all those guys on the 100 prospects list on, on the field, he'd be one of the more polished ones. So that's not to say that there are lower level guys that have more of a ceiling. But uh, I think that's an important thing when you're looking at a top 100 list going into this next season. No question. And two guys that we just talked about, kind of an easy segue here. Chance Adams, Estevan Florial. You just talked about how impressive it was that he was on Baseball America's top 100 list. Well, one list that those two guys didn't make was Keith Law of ESPN's top 100 list. He had the other four Yankee prospects, but his list did not have Chance Adams or Esteban Florial. I think that's crazy. Guys, your reaction? Yeah, to me, I mean, Florial not being on the list is a bit crazy. Uh, the only thing I can think of is that he's only 20 years old, um, and he did have a penchant to strike out a lot last year. Now, that's partly due to his age. Um, he's he's going to learn how to hit. He's, he's got the skills. He also knows which approach he should take. He tends to be over aggressive in the, in the count, early in the count, I should say. So he's he's going to learn how to hit, and he's only going to get better. He he has all the tools, the raw tools there. It's just a matter of him holding everything together to become the player that he can be. And he's he's only 20 years old, so to, for him to be, you know, basically it looks like st- starting here at Trenton this year. I mean, that's incredible to to consider, you know, how old he is, and in fact that he's already made the the you know top 100 list. Um, for Baseball America, who's who's a you know I, I don't mean to knock Keith Law, but I tend to t- I tend to trust Baseball America more than than Keith Law. So um, I, I think that's a, a tremendous accomplishment and speaks volumes to to someone like Florio. Yeah, and, and that was well said. When it with his, it's kind of it is kind of crazy to not have Esteban Florio on there. Uh, I could understand it just because his age, and, and honestly, he really put himself on the map this past season. You didn't hear too much hype about him the year before, but it, and as far as Chance Adams, I I guess again, I mean, we did debate whether he should have been on the the Baseball America top 100, so I could see that. But yeah, I I mean, it's kind of I don't know, I don't I don't know where he where he ranked those, but I could honestly say that I, that Florio 100% should have been on there, so. You know, you definitely question the validity of that. And as the numbers that Adams put up is definitely better than, you know, most guys at the AAA level and ready to knock on that door. So uh, it, they both would have been well-deserved, but it is up for debate. So I think that's just how he sees it. No question about that. And as far as Esteban Florial, here's a kid 19 years old, appeared in the Futures game, was deemed untouchable by Brian Cashman. So I don't think there's any question at all that He's a top 100 prospect. So, agree to disagree. That's Keith Law's list. He's got to do his thing. Uh, But I'm with you guys, sticking with Baseball America. Some names on that list that a lot of us would recognize, but no longer associated with the Yankees. Dustin Fowler, Jorge Mateo, Jorge Guzman. And that still hurts that Jorge Guzman's not associated with the Yankees, personally. But, guys, obviously, uh, Fowler and Mateo included in that Sonny Gray deal. Guys with a huge upside. You know what you're going to get from Mateo, I think. He just seems to be blocked in the system, so he was expendable. But Fowler, big question mark, coming back from injury. Were you surprised to see him on this list and where he fell, considering you know, he suffered a, a really big injury last year? Yeah, that injury was gruesome, and it's one that could really derail a career if it doesn't heal right. So I actually, Fowler especially, I was surprised to see on there. But, you know, I, I got to see a lot of them last year, and I can tell you that the kid was one of my favorite prospects in the Yankee system when they had him, just because of the way he goes about his business and the way that he just gives all out, obviously, for every single play. Uh, his bat is dynamic. Uh, he, you know, he's, he's a big pool hitter. I'm sure he'll get better at that as, as, as he gets a little bit uh, more developed. But he... Uh, I don't know. I guess he he just didn't strike me as somebody who would crack that list. But otherwise, though, I mean, like I said, the the dynamic and the and the fire in the 
in him is just outstanding. So, uh, you know, he's definitely going to be a prospect that the Yankees are, are going to miss. Mateo, we all know about him before, before the Yankees went on their, their trade um, run a couple of years ago. Mateo was probably the number one prospect in their entire system. And last year, he, he started off not so great, but when he got promoted to Trenton, he was on an absolute tear and showed what he can do. So he is, absolutely needs to be on that list. Uh, and I think it speaks volumes as to where the Yankees farm system was, because if they never traded those guys away, I mean, they were looking at, what was it, like nine players on that list? You know, almost a tenth of the entire list. So uh, it's it's nice to see, and and the depth is outstanding, and it still is. Yeah, just kind of kind of add something in there about Mateo and Fowler. In, in a lot of ways, they, they seem like they're almost um, opposite players. Now, you you kind of wish you know Fowler's attitude was in Mateo and, and vice versa because um, and talent wise, you know Mateo Mateo has the raw talent to be a great player. He just needs to um, you know basically focus. Um, that's that's his big issue. And then Fowler, I mean, he'll he'll grit everything out. He'll run out every play. He'll he'll grind it to play. He's one of those guys. Whereas you know, you may not have the greatest overall raw talent, but he makes the most of it. So it's just kind of polar opposites with those two guys. I know we've talked about a lot of lists at this point, but one more list to touch on. My apologies in advance if you're getting tired of hearing about these lists. But MLB Pipeline has been releasing top 10 prospects list per position, and Yankee fans should be excited about this. Justice Sheffield ranked number three on their list of lefty pitching prospects, and Miguel Andujar also ranked number three on their list of third baseman prospects. So this has to be exciting if you're a Yankee fan, like I just said, because there's a good chance Andujar may be the Yankees' third baseman this year. So I know these are players that we have a lot of familiarity with. And again, reaction. Guys, any shock, surprise to see this list and, and these guys where they fell? Well, we all kind of know what Sheffield has been, what kind of clinic he put on the Arizona Fall League. So absolutely not surprising to see him there, especially because left-handed starting pitchers are usually a little bit more rare. So it's, you know, I, actually I was probably a little surprised he wasn't higher than three because he, he's just been outstanding uh, the la you know, last year, plus you throw in the Arizona Fall League. But Anduar definitely the thing to be most excited about if you're a Yankee fan being number three on that list and if you read the, the scouting report on him they said that he has average defense a cannon for an arm uh, and his defense should only get better uh, that is probably the most encouraging thing out of there be, just because the that's the biggest question mark at this point it, I think if you told Brian Cashman that he was going to get average defense out of him this year I think you sign up for that because that's the biggest concern up to this point. But they also said that he's going to be like a 300 hitter, probably hit about 20 bombs. I mean, that's absolutely. I mean, that's a nice compliment to the lineup that they're putting out. In fact, the lineup probably is going to lack more 300 hitters. So that's going to be something important. So, you know, obviously he's probably not going to come into his rookie year and hit 300, but if that's what he projects to as a, over his career, the Yankees have something special there. So, Absolutely something to be excited about if you're a Yankee fan. No, and I absolutely agree with Tommy. I mean, you know, it, as far as Andrew Hart goes, he needs to work on his footwork. Um, that's his, his big bugaboo, but he's a he's a good hitter. He has a cannon for an arm. Um, we look at Sheffield, this guy who, who throws, you know, mid-90s, has a good change, good curveball, uh, just needs to be a little more consistent with his delivery. I mean, he's, these are guys right on the cusp of, of being contributors for a long, long time. And, and uh, I think that's uh, that's also a um, something as far as Cashman when he says you know he he trusts you know Glaber Torres and Chef or uh, Andrew Hart third to start you know 2018. Um, so I mean that's that's high praise for those guys and uh, you know if I I think Cashman will probably make one more move uh, to fill one of those slots, but um, I, I'm not opposed to letting those guys have a shot and, and see how it works out for at least a month or two. You know just a kind of touch on what you guys just said. There has been a lot of talk swirling around Andujar's defense and his footwork and the errors and everything, but I just had the chance to do his profile for our top 75 list. 
So for anyone following, you know that we've just we've been putting out the top 75 Yankees prospects in the system profiles for each player over the last few weeks. Actually, since the beginning of the year, since the start of 2018, we've been putting out a few a day. And Andrew Harz just came out a couple of days ago. And if you look at the numbers, his errors have been going down. Last year, his defense really improved. His errors went down. The bat is, is you can say, worst kept secret. Everyone knows how good his bat is. And if you weren't sure how it would translate to the majors, well, you know, he kind of put on, although a small sample size, put it on display in Chicago in that series last season, which unfortunately also had the Dustin Fowler injury, which may have overshadowed really what should have been the story, which was Andrew Hart can hit and he can hit well and he could be a force in the lineup. So honestly, I'm kind of tired of all this chatter. Oh, his defense, this his defense, that I would be very comfortable with him playing at the, at the hot, hot corner to start the season. If he struggles, he struggles. You've got reinforcements. You've got Tyler Wade. Uh, you've got the Tonight Show ready to go, and that's fine. You plug him in as needed, but just the, oh, his defense, his defense. I f- feel like someone said that, and that's all people are hanging on to now. But I, I really would have no issue with him starting the season there, no issue with Torres starting at second base, and you, you roll the dice, and there's going to be growing pains, but you go. I mean, this lineup is going to score runs. There's no way they're not going to put up runs. This lineup is going to score. So you take, Tommy, I think you said it, you take average defense, you sign up for that, bumps as you go, and put him out there. Let him develop. That's why, that's why you have him. That's why you groom him. So, yeah, as far as Andy Har goes, uh, no surprise to see him where he fell on that list. Same thing with Sheffield. Had the chance to see Sheffield a few times at Trenton last year. The thing that stands out most about him, maybe off topic a little bit, is just his demeanor on the mound. He looks like a, he looks like a veteran on the mound. He doesn't get flustered. He gets into trouble. He buckles down. And he's definitely got the makeup to make it on a, on a big league mound. So I think those are two guys that you will see it in the Bronx this year, whether it's the start of the year or at some point. But no question. That list, solid list. The number one lefty prospect was a kid on the Padres, blanking on his name right now, but someone I do have some familiarity with, and he's good, so I'm actually not surprised to see him number one. The guy who's number two, eh, maybe Sheffield there, maybe not. But... I think it was uh, AJ Puck, was it not? Yes. Yeah. Yes. There you go, Puck. And I think, for me, that's a coin toss. Sheffield, Puck, could go either way. But, um, yeah, just... Can we stop talking about Andrew Hart's defense? Look at his numbers. Look, look at look at how drastically his errors went down last year. Go read, go check out the profiles. Go check not just his. Go check out all the profiles. That you can find that on our website, pinstripeprospects.com. It of course is the top 75 prospects list that has been going on since January 1st, like I said. And exciting stuff. We're, we're down the home stretch right now. Top 20 prospects coming out as I speak. As as we're doing this. So go check those out for sure. And don't forget that Pinstripe Prospects is your number one source for all Yankees Prospects news. Follow us everywhere. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So no excuses. Stay up to date and learn about these guys so that when you're at the water cooler and some guy goes, oh, and Newhart's defense is lackluster, you can throw the information you learned in his profile back at that guy's face and go, actually, it's not as bad as you think. Okay, but and rant. Sorry, guys. I, I got very passionate about that and rant. Well, real quick, I, I would just, to build off your point a little bit, I can tell you that every single day, uh, Andrew Har is out there working on his defense to try to get better. He's, a, he's an extremely yep. hard worker, and yep. you know he's, he is progressively getting better at it. Uh, I think just the reason why that this is such a big deal is because the last couple of years, the Yankees have put such a premium on defense. Uh, I mean, you really see it there. They, you know, that's kind of how Hicks ended up in the outfield over a guy like, uh, you know, Ellsbury or how, whoever, just because his defense is phenomenal. So I think that you're, you're so used to seeing a guy with an amazing glove like Headley over there or Frazier that, you know, the Yankee fans aren't used to having average defense somewhere. That being said, his arm is also going to make up for a lot of misplays on the field too, just because it's that strong. So um, just to, to throw that out there, but yeah, if he's at the major league level, you could, you could guarantee he's going to work very hard to get that up. 
I can't add anything to, that, anything to that. That was perfect. But transitioning to our next topic, which is, will probably be an easy transition because it's about the pitch clock, and that's probably should have been implemented on my rant a second ago. My rant probably should have had a pitch clock. But uh, MLB, MLB right now, big topic, grabbing headlines this past week. The, player un- the players union and the league can't get in agreement on this. They want to implement uh, basically pace of play rules, just like they did yeah, in the minors. March 2015, minor league baseball adopted pace of play, where the umpires monitored the time taken between innings and pitches, and they limited the amount of time allowed during pitching changes. Umpires also uh, enforced rules prohibiting batters from leaving the batter's box between pitches. So I think that's a big one. I think the amount of time that batters have in between pitches, stepping out and doing their gloves and doing everything else, that would shave off a lot of time. Obviously, you can point at the commercial being an issue. That's not going to change. Time between innings, kind of connected to that, not going to change. But... Guys, I, I feel like since this has been implemented in the minors, no one's had an issue with it. So why is there so much resistance with this discussion at the major league level? Tommy, take it away. Well, because everybody hates change, especially if you have those old school you know, baseballers who just want to play the game like it was in, in the 1920s. And, you know, it's but it really isn't that big of a deal because you don't realize it, as a player, especially that hasn't had the pitch clock. I don't think you, you realize how much time you're taking and how much time you're wasting. So I, it, you're going to get used to it. It's going to be different to start, but it's it's really you're right. It isn't a big deal. And when you when you watch the minor league players do it, a lot of them, they're not watching the clock. They're not like racing to get into the box. So, it, I mean, it's just. If they naturally go about their business and don't sit there and think about things for you know 30 seconds and then step in and you know take a deep breath and what have you, they they're not gonna come close to to even worrying about the pitch clock. So it's it's something that they don't want specifically because they're not used to it and they think it's gonna cause chaos. But uh, I don't see that being an issue at all and, and once they get used to it they're not going to complain about it either um so I, I don't see why why that shouldn't be implemented but yeah it's it's definitely something that they need to do the games need to be shortened it's they're you know they do take too long and you lose fans over it so anything to to improve that should should be welcome for sure so yeah for sure yeah, no, and Tommy's right. I mean, if you go to a minor league game, you, it's not like you can't. It's not like you you don't recognize the game anymore. It's it's still you know going to be ninety feet you know to the bases, sixty feet six inches from the home plate to the pitching mound. Also, I mean, it's this these rules have been in effect in the minors for a couple of years now. So as more and more players come up through the minors, um, they're not. It's not going to be that big of a, a difference from what they they grew up with, so to speak. So. This is this is going to happen eventually. It's just a matter of when and if. So um, there's a lot of hand wringing over it right now, and I don't personally understand it. I've never seen anything, you know, like a, a like a play or a pitch or anything affected by the pitch clock. Even though there's been lots of speculation of, oh, well, you know, the runners are going to get a, a jump. Well, I mean, if, if you throw a pitch well before the, the pitch clock ends, um, then you know that's 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 a mood issue. So. All this, is, to me, is silly. It's just a matter of getting it implemented and, and getting used to it. And also, I mean, you can impl- start to implement things without being strict about it and then kind of move on from there as well. So um, to me, it's, it's all kind of, you know, a lot of stuff between the, the union and the, and, the, and the owners that you just wonder if there's ulterior motives sometimes between the two. Well, all right. Can we agree on this? There is a problem and it needs to be addressed. Yeah, absolutely. The games take way too long. It, even as a diehard baseball fan as I am, and I really don't mind sitting and watching a game for three hours, but you know, there are certain points in, in the middle of June where you're just like, wow, I can't believe this game is still, still on or it's dragging. Or So it, it needs to be addressed. The game is in a good spot right now, but it could be better, and you could really attract more broad of a crowd by doing that. Now, that being said, uh, I don't know if I would implement it completely like they have in the minor leagues, 
because when you're in the minors, let's face it, everything is focused on developing your pitches and, and things like that. So they're, they're not entirely having the catchers going to the mound and saying, you know, what pitch am I throwing now? At the major league level, there's a lot more pressure on the type of pitch that you're about to throw. So what I would do to combat that is I probably wouldn't implement the pitch clock on a 3-2 count or something along those lines just because there are certain situations where I feel like you do need to sit back, think about what pitch is going to be best. Uh, if, if that's because you don't want to see a pitcher rushing a decision and you know hanging a pitch and, and letting it out. But uh, I, so I think that it, from that aspect, you can maybe tweak it a bit. But overall, in every other aspect of the game, I feel like it should definitely be there. And Joe, what do you think as far as this issue of the game being drawn out? Obviously, baseball is trying to bring in some new fans. It is kind of hurting in ratings the last few years. And the length of games is a drag, especially today with the younger generation and their attention span being non-existent. So what do you think as far as addressing this and what changes need to be made? Well, I mean, these, these changes, I think, are good changes overall, so I'm, I'm not opposed to them. I, I think they should be implemented eventually. So to me, it's, again, it's, as Tommy started off with, it's change and nobody likes change. So it's, it's going to get done eventually, and, and it really needs to be taken care of because, you know, when the game's lasting, you know, three, three and a half hours, that's an issue. Uh, when, when I was growing up, I, you know, I grew up in the 80s, games were two and a half hours. I mean, you were, you know, at the ballpark and you were out. And, you know, the Yankees used to start games when I was growing up um, at 7.30. Now now the game started at 7, and, you know, sometimes they don't get over with till 10.30 for a nine-inning game. So this, this definitely needs to be addressed and should be implemented. And, and the union and, and the owners have to get together and, and figure this out because you, for a lot of people, you know, the attention span is, as you mentioned, Rob, it's just not there. So you gotta you got to keep things moving, keep the pace going. Um, if you watch old... Old, um, you know, clips of, you know, say someone like Whitey Ford, he was basically in his windup before the ball even came back from the mound. So it's just a different kind of, you know, attitude these days. But, it, you know, the, the players have to look at the greater good and, and go along with some of these changes. And it something. Also, sorry. It could also get a pitcher in rhythm, too, because if you think about it, uh, it, back to when Michael Pineda was, you know, either in his good stretch or his bad stretch, the one thing they always talked about was when he was going well, he was getting right back on that mound ready to pitch and ready to attack the hitter. Like, it could be, it's an advantage to the pitcher to get right back on the mound and, it, you know, make the hitter feel a little uncomfortable. So there, there shouldn't really be too many problems with that. And I just have to say, I look forward to pitcher. I realize long ball and high scoring game is the exciting thing, but I always look forward to a pitcher's duel. Because the pitchers still usually last about two and a half hours, three up, three down, three up, three down, one or two nothing games, two one, and those are the best. And maybe I sound like an old grouch right now, but two, like you said, Joe, two and a half hour games, that should be the norm. When a game is two and a half hours, it's fantastic. I remember one of the first games I covered in Staten Island this past season, it went two hours and four minutes, and I, I couldn't believe it. A nine inning baseball game, two hours and four minutes, it was fantastic. And I just think it makes everyone happier. It keeps everyone more involved. And it makes you look forward to going back again because it, there's no drag. There's no boredom at any point. So definitely something that hopefully they work out and gets uh, rectified sooner rather than later. And we'll have to keep an eye on it. I know that I saw a report today that Tony Clark was going to go back to the Players Union and discuss some things. This was on that list. So maybe they can reach an agreement for this season. We'll see. But speaking of stuff I did see today, there's a poll out there, guys. Who is entering the 2018 season with more pressure? Aaron Boone or John Carlos Stan? I thought it was a good question. Joe, let's start with you this time. Who do you think? Well, to me, I mean, it's, it's going to be Boone because he's replacing somebody, you know, Girardi, who did have success, got, got the Yankees to win one game of the World Series. So the, the pressure is going to be on him mainly. That's not to say, you know, like with Stan, if he, if he gets off to a slow start, he won't, you know, start to, to hear the boo birds or, or the, feel the pressure. Um, that definitely was going to happen. But overall, as the season goes on and progresses, 
it's going to be on Boone if things don't go well or, or things don't go as well as the fans might think they should. Um, so to me, it's it's it all starts at the t- uh, at the top, so to speak, and it would it would fall on Boone rather than Stan. Yeah, there's there's probably more pressure on Boone, just because he's a rookie manager and it is the Yankees. But as far as Stanton goes, there's a long history of big time names coming over to the Yankees, and it is just unbelievably important for him to get off to a big start. Now, Stanton will have a lot of his own personal pressures. He hit 59 home runs last year. He was unbelievable. Can he be that same player again this year? Is that the type of player that he is more, or is he the type of player that he was a couple of years before that, where still a monster, but you know, not 59 home runs worth of a monster? So there's there's that. Then there is, you know, maybe not between the two of them, but you just you know that the media is going to cover him and Judge basically comparing the two of them all season. They did it last year. Now they're on the same team. So. You just know that if one of them is outpacing the other, they're gonna, there's going to be a lot of comparison article out there. Uh, it's going to be very similar to Mickey Mantle and uh, <clears throat> Roger Maris. They were compared the same way. The M&M so, boys. Yeah, absolutely. This I mean, we, Nicknames still to be determined on these two. But it, so there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of pressure just from the media in that aspect. And let's face it, Miami is not the same media market that New York is. So you're also going to have to deal with that. So maybe as far as public pressure goes, it's going to be Aaron Boone. But as far as personal pressure goes, it's probably going to be Giancarlo Stanton. So we're all about balance here. And I'm going to provide what's missing from this balance. Joe said Boone. You took kind of both sides, Tommy. And I'm just going to go with Stan. I think the pressure is 100% on Stan. I think Boone is coming in, kind of house money, really has no business in the position, personally, if you ask me. He's going to be handed a binder with every answer to every question or anything that, can, that comes up. He's going to go strictly off of analytics. So he's going to have all the answers in a binder. He's going to go by the numbers. So as far as those tough decisions, I think they're going to be made for him for the most part. But I think Stanton's coming in and he's supposed to be the piece that pushes his team over the top. This is a team that made it to Game 7 of the ALCS last year without him. So he's coming in now, and he's supposed to be that piece that brings them not just to the World Series, but wins the World Series. And it's funny because that's actually something he said at his press conference when he was introduced. He basically said what drew him so much to the Yankees was that everything wasn't on his back. He didn't have to be the guy who did everything and, and the whole team was on his shoulders, but he did want to be that piece that kind of tipped everything over, that tipped the scales completely over to that World Series victory. I'm trying really hard to remember exactly what he said, but I'm blanking a little bit. It was a while ago. But um, yeah, so I think that if he has a tough stretch or the power numbers go down or if he starts getting hurt again, I think he's going to get crushed. So I think I do think the pressure is on him. He exercised in the no trade clause. He wanted to come here. This was his choice. And here he is. And now it's, it's put up or shut up. But I will say, I would never say any of this to his face. Have you guys seen his workout videos that have been going on Instagram and Twitter? Because they're insane. I don't know how a human could even accomplish that at all. Uh, I definitely wouldn't be able to say it to his face because I'm probably about half his height too. So... Yeah, seriously. Yeah, and, and one thing I'll, I'll say about that, Rob, uh, your point is I, I do see where you're coming from, but with, with a lot of fans, they don't, they don't understand that the analytics side a lot of times, so I, I think they'll, they'll still blame Boone for whatever, even if he does everything by the book, even if he's, you know, he's supposed to. I still think fans will, will jump all over him because they, they jumped all over Girardi, and, you know, it's, I, I'm not going to say it's a valid criticism. It's the way the Yankees want things run. I mean, that's that's basically the reason why they kind of pushed Girardi out and kind of put in, in Boone, but I don't think that's going to make the fans understand his, his position or his, or his predicament, maybe at times, um, when he makes moves. So, um, I mean, we all see it, obviously, with the pitch man, you know, the, the track man 
equipment in every ballpark and and how these guys pour over the the stats and 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 everything else. Uh, so I don't think a lot of fans understand how pervasive um, that that mindset is in the Yankee system and and don't realize that Boone may not have the the luxury of just going with his gut and and bringing in somebody that goes against the numbers in the, in the binder, so to speak. That's a good point, Joe. Definitely, the, like you said, the fans are result-based, and they know what they have with Girardi, and they don't care about a binder or anything else. They're going to point the blame where they want to point the blame. So that is a good point. So Boone definitely will have some scrutiny there. But I just think that he's just coming in here like, I don't know, I guess ignorance is bliss. Like he doesn't, he just doesn't belong in this position. I think it's way over his head, but he's personable. He relates to the players. He's a young, new voice. You see a lot of major league teams going in this direction. And it's something that, obviously, I think everyone hopes works out. And it's something we'll have to keep an eye on. And speaking of a situation that we hope works out, circling back a little bit to a conversation we were having earlier, this kind of ties in with that. Brian Cashman, in an interview last week, was asked, are you comfortable going into the season with rookies at second and third base? And his answer was, well, as of right now, that's the plan. That caught me by surprise a little bit. I think he's just saying what he has to say, and he's kind of talking the talk. But, guys, do you think that he is actually comfortable with this, or are there more moves looming for the Yankees? Joe, we'll start with you again. Yeah, I still think there's there's at least one move coming to fill one either third or second. Uh, I just It's just a gut feeling more than anything. Although I think if, if he has to play uh, Glaber Torres or Miguel Andahar, then that's what he'll do. I don't think he'll shy away from doing that. Um, but with that said, I, I really do think he, there's one more move to be made somewhere, and, and they're going to look at everyone in spring training and, and figure out where to go. Um, so I think he's he may be saying that a little bit, but I think he also means it. And on, on the one hand, if you know, because these guys are that close to being ready, so it's it's time to you know if you can't find a, a suitable trade, then you you know there's always a trade deadline. You still you know you still. Have, you're, you're not hand, you know, your, your hands aren't tied um, until after the trade deadline. So I think he's, you know, he's comfortable with at least starting the year with those two guys and then see how it goes. Yeah, I, I agree. I think if they had to start the season with both of them, it would probably, one, mean that they won the job in spring training. So that means that they were doing well to begin with. But two, I mean, their, their talent level is off the charts. So... It's not like their their chances are they're going to come up and, and hit 100 all year. And if they do, there's plenty of options behind them to to try out. I mean, you could even stick to Reyes there, and you'll be fine. Uh, so the odds of all four of the guys that they have uh, to put in that spot this year without bringing anybody in not doing well is pretty small. So yeah, I, I think that he's totally fine with that. That being said, it could also be a little, you know talking just because he might be talking to some free agents or having a few trades and wants it on the record that he's saying that these guys are good enough that they could be in my starting lineup that I plan to bring to the World Series this year. So that's a possibility too, but I think that if push comes to shove, he's 100% comfortable putting those guys there because he sees them being there in the long term to begin with. So it's, it's almost time. A lot of questions still remain with pitchers and catchers reported in just a couple of weeks from now. So we'll see how this whole thing turns out, and we'll monitor the situation closely. Guys, great stuff. But before we go, we've got a special, uh, a little special add-on to this podcast this time, something that we're going to hope to be doing more of as we go forward with the Pinstripe Prospects podcast, and that is an exclusive interview with a Yankees prospect. This week, our very own... Ricky Keeler had a chance to talk with Taylor Widener, who, of course, is a right-handed pitcher. He's a converted from reliever to starter. He spent last year with the Tampa Yankees, and he is another one of those rising stars, someone that we believe has a bright future. And Ricky really did a great job with this interview, so I'm going to toss it to that, and then we'll come back to say bye. Enjoy this interview with Taylor Widener. Hello, everybody. This is Ricky Keeler from Pinstripe Prospects here today with Yankees pitching prospect Taylor Widener, who the team took in the 12th round back in 2016 out of South Carolina. So I wanted to start with uh, 
your draft experience. Uh, you were selected by the Yankees in the 12th round back in 2016. What was that experience like for you, and what were you doing when you found out that the Yankees were going to draft you? I was uh, I was actually in the middle of a or it was right before a game there in uh, Super Regionals against I think it was Oklahoma State we were playing, and one of my buddies that's actually from New York came up to me. I was like, dude, he's got uh, selected by the Yankees. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. It was like every little kid's dream is to play, put on the pinstripes. I mean, it was a pretty surreal experience. That's for sure. Were the Yankees your favorite team when you grew up watching baseball? I actually grew up a Braves fan. To Atlanta. So, I mean, because in South Carolina, we didn't have a professional baseball team. So, it was, the Braves were the closest team to us. Do you have any favorite pitchers that you like to watch as you were uh, developing as a pitcher through high school, college, and out into the pros? Uh, not really. I never really watched baseball. I uh, I watched a lot of baseball. My idol when I was younger was Chipper Jones, but uh, uh, took a different route than him. So. <laughs> now, for someone who hasn't seen you pitch, how would you describe your pitch arsenal and? how you go about it when you're on the mound? Well, I would definitely say that I'm very aggressive up on the mound, that most of the time that I'm going to go right at people. And I feel like that's my main weapon. It's just, that's like I'm always in attack mode, and I just really want to go right after people. Uh, what kind of pitches uh, do you throw? I throw a uh, fastball, a curveball, and a changeup. Okay. Now, in college at South, at South Carolina, how did pitching in the SEC and, like you mentioned, pitching in the Super Regional help prepare you for professional baseball? Uh, it gave me – I think it prepared me a lot because the high-pressure situations that I threw in, and um, it was – every time you were facing an SEC lineup, there was a bunch of good hitters. And the majority of the guys out of the SEC lineup, I feel like they're going to play professional baseball, so – it's just uh, it's a good cal the caliber of baseball, and I think it really helped me get ready. Was there one particular hitter that you had a tough time with in the conference that you might have been might have seen now in your minor league career as well? Uh, not that I can think of. Okay. Now, last season you got the chance to be a starter with Tampa, but you had gone through starting and relieving. What's the toughest part about making that transition to the rotation? Uh, it's definitely just been able to, like, start off the game, and you just you can't. I don't want to say you can't get after it completely because it's still you got to go out there and give it a hundred percent. But you just have to have a better stamina, and you have to just be able to pitch more so than when you're coming out of the bullpen. You just really get to go at guys because you're most likely going to face the lineup maybe once. So you have to learn how to pitch to certain guys and pitch backwards and be able to throw like a change-up on an 0 count or a 1 count. Did doing both in college sort of help you ease into the transition with the Yankees? Uh, yeah, I think so. Because my whole time growing up, I was always in high school, I threw just about seven innings every week. And in college, I was back and forth. And uh, it helped me get some experience. Now, over your final 14 starts at Tampa, you had a 2.64 ERA. What was the key, you think, to your second half success? I just started to learn how to pitch. I was able to – the thing that we kept harping on last season was throwing the changeup and getting that. And I just – I started getting more and more comfortable throwing that changeup. And that just – that made a huge difference for me because I was throwing it to both righties and lefties. And I, I felt comfortable throwing in almost any count. Back on August 13th, you were uh, taking on Port St. Lucie. You left the game after five no-hit innings. What is that like when you leave the game with a no-hitter in progress? Are you still getting the silent treatment from your from the dugout, even though you're out of the game? What is that atmosphere like? I mean, nobody, everybody knows the superstition in baseball, so nobody really says anything throughout the game. And it's, I don't know, it's, I feel like everybody treats you the same, whether you're pitching good or you're pitching bad. Now, in September, you got a chance to pitch for Trenton, and you and Justice Sheffield combined to throw a no-hitter in the postseason. 
what was it like being part of that experience? That was a pretty good experience. I actually had no clue that we had a no-hitter going on because I, when I came into the game, I saw that there was one hit up on the scoreboard, mm-hmm. and I guess they overruled it. And uh, so I had absolutely no clue when everybody came running out onto the field. I was kind of like, what in the world's going on? <laughs> Now, when you get to Trenton for the postseason, what is that acclimation? How quick do you adjust to getting to know new players, getting to know your teammates right in the middle of a, a postseason push? Uh, I feel like I'm a pretty easy, easygoing guy. Like I make friends with a lot of people pretty easily. So I've, I've never really had trouble with going to an area and making friends. So I don't really, I've never really looked at it that way. I just, we're all, I get up there and we're all a team. And I've seen the majority of the guys during spring training, so you get to hang out with a lot of those guys. So I think that that makes it a lot easier. Was there one player that you clicked with in particular? Uh, uh, Not necessarily. Okay. Uh, So when you were at Tampa, uh, Jay Bell was your manager. Uh, What was he like as a manager now that he's going up to double a uh what can yankee fans know about him he's a great he's about as good as the guys you're gonna get he's a his passion for the game is unreal and just the knowledge that he has on the game that he's played for so long and just like i said just the, his passion for the game he makes you want to just get out there and be better every day now while you're at south carolina you got a chance to play with two pitchers who are now with the Yankees in some way, shape, or form. Uh, back in 2014, you got to uh, be in the same pitching staff as Jordan Montgomery. Uh, what impressed you about Jordan when you were his teammate, and uh, have you talked to him since you were drafted? Uh, the thing that's always impressed me about Jordan is his composure, and just whether he's throwing a great game or he's struggling a little bit, he's always got a good composure. And he's he's not going to change up his philosophy if something's going wrong. And he's just always been a very relaxed, laid back pitcher who just knows how to pitch. And uh, I uh, last year there in spring training, I lived with Jordan, so I talked to him a good bit. You know, what what was that experience like? It was fun. It's we had completely different time schedules with the big league games going on at night, and ours were early in the morning. Mm-hmm. So once we started uh, the actual spring training after Cabin's camp, we didn't uh, see each other really as much. This past June, the Yankees uh, selected Clark Schmidt in the first round, who was another one of your teammates. Uh, yes. Did you give any advice to Clark? And while Yankee fans haven't seen him pitch professionally yet, what do you, what stood out to you about him? What can Yankee fans expect from him? They can expect another bulldog, honestly. He's... He's another guy that's going to go right at people. He's got a really good fastball with movement. And he's got an incredible slider that he likes to put away people with. And he's just he's another really good guy. You mentioned you pitched in the Super Regionals. You've also pitched in postseason minor league baseball. What's the, what's the difference or similarity between the two? Uh, I mean, I'd have to say they're both pretty similar. There's both a lot on the line for both of them and I don't really look at it as postseason I just I go game by game you can't really put too much pressure on yourself and be like oh this is a postseason game looking back at last season what did you take away from it as you head into this year just how much I have to work on the consistency of all my pitches and how big of a difference that is because that's what separates minor league guys from the major league guys how much more consistent they are and how they can throw whatever they want whenever they want for a strike. And just got to keep working on that. So that. You would say that's part of your goals going into this season? Absolutely. Now, what is looking back at your career so far, what's the advice that stuck to you from any of the coaches that you've had? I mean, just everybody's always saying, like, you just got to go out there and be yourself. You can't try and do something that somebody else does. You just have to go out there and be yourself because you got selected and we're in our situation. 
right now from stuff that we've done in the past and stuff that's made it successful. And they just, they don't really try and change up too much on you. They just fine tune you. And so they just want you to go out there and be yourself. Now, if you hadn't become a professional baseball player, what would have been your second career choice? Uh, I was studying criminal justice in South Carolina. So I would have tried to do something in probably like the federal with like the FBI or something in that realm of things. Did you have a favorite crime TV show? Uh, yeah, I watched uh, NCIS a lot. <laughs> When, as you guys were going about uh, your season this year, how much attention did you guys pay to what was going on with the big league club? Well, I mean, we always had when their games were going on and we were out playing, we'd always have their games on in the clubhouse, so we would watch it a good bit. You guys had one of the better records in the Florida State League especially in the second half, and I talked to one of your teammates, Brian Keller, about this. What is it like as you guys go through and each starter's putting up great outing after great outing, the pressure to fo- – not the pressure, but the ability to follow each other up after each starter performs as well as you guys did? I don't think any of us really look at it that way. It's We just – we just both have to go out there and do our own thing, and as long as we keep us in the game – we're doing our job. Like, I don't really see like a, there's not really like a competition to put up the same numbers. Mm-hmm. It's just because, I mean, certain days you're going to hit better than other days. So you just got to keep going out there and just keep it a close ball game. We know the Florida State League is uh, usually a uh, pitcher friendly environment. What is it like to pitch in that league as opposed to getting that experience in? Penn League and South Atlantic League like you did in 2016? Well, it was definitely a good experience. The, every time you move up, the caliber of baseball goes up. You can start seeing that hitters have a better approach. And you can definitely see the pitcher's league at the beginning of the year mm-hmm. when everybody's down there for like every every game. Somebody's coming out of the bullpen throwing 100. And it's just crazy to see how much like how many people actually can do that so for those yankee fans that are uh, listening to this interview what's your message to them stick with us (laughs) just uh keep pulling us up keep pulling for us and just if somebody has a bad game don't get down on them it happens to us how does that feel at being in the organization when you see the team go out there and trade for a John Carlos fan? It makes me feel better that possibly in the future I don't have to pitch to. <laughs> is, is there one hitter in particular that you're excited about one day going up against? Not really. I haven't. I haven't really felt about that. Okay. Uh, Taylor, again, thanks again for the time. Definitely appreciate it. Uh, Best of luck in 2018, and thanks for talking with me. All right, no problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, that is going to do it for this 39th edition of the Pinstripe Prospects Podcast, brought to you by Velocity 5 Sports Restaurant and Bar in Sterling, Virginia. Don't forget, if you have anything you would like to hear discussed on this podcast, feel free to reach out to us at any time. You can contact our managing partner and executive producer of the podcast, Mr. Robert Pimsner at rob at pinstripeprospects.com or feel free to reach out to me, R. Terranova at pinstripeprospects.com. A little longer, my apologies. Also, don't forget we are here for you, so do not hesitate to reach out. We also would appreciate it if you would subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and the Google Play Store. And if you could find it in your heart, please give us that five-star rating. That is important to us in keeping this going and to growing our viewership. So, for Joseph Dixon, Tommy Romanelli, and our man behind the camera, Mr. Robert Pimsner, I'm Rob Terranova. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Pinstripe Prospects Podcast, and we look forward to checking in again with you next week. Until then, take care and go Yankees.